Thank you, Kim. And uh, wow, there's people. This is awesome. Is it raining out? <laughs> I'm really impressed. I was saying I'm not sure I would have been here if I didn't have to be. So I really appreciate you taking the time this afternoon to come. Um, my format's going to be a little bit different. So I don't have any evidence slides. Um, I have very few references. Um, what I'm hoping will happen throughout the next 20 minutes is that I'll spark a few thoughts, maybe some, you know, without quoting Oprah too much, a few aha moments. Um, and maybe some disagreements, given the nature of what these topics are supposed to be about. So um, the question that I was given to talk about is, will accommodation of persons with obesity promote obesity? And where to go? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. That's the answer to the question. And I don't really have much more to say than that. So uh, it's going to be a short little talk. Um, it will promote obesity. And I'll explain a little bit about what I mean for that later. Um, in the spirit of disclosures and acknowledgments, I, I, I wanted to just put forth um, that I am supported currently through Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada Junior Personnel Award uh, in my current postdoc fellowship in a cardiac rehab program. I do have, I am currently doing a little bit of consulting with Janssen around some qualitative studies in diabetes. I have worked for Shoppers Home Healthcare as a speaker and uh, um, I have been sponsored by the Chicken Farmers of Canada before. So um, I put that on there because it's different. And it's true. <laughs> so I have no perceived conflicts of interest to, to disclose. So I want to explain a little bit more about what I mean by uh, accommodations of persons with obesity actually promoting obesity. And when I think about the word promotion, when I was first asked to do the talk, my first uh, instinct was to think of promotion as an increase in the prevalence uh, in the rates of obesity. And, uh, and I was really stuck on that for quite some time. I have to say several weeks uh, while I was mulling over the direction of this talk. And um, I thought, no, I've, I've really got to think this through. And when I started looking up how we define promotion, it's really about advancement, it's about growth, and it's about publicity, which when I think in the context of obesity is actually about visibility. And so I'm looking through this topic through the lens of a rehabilitation practitioner. I, I worked as an occupational therapist for almost 20 years before I went back to school to do research training. And uh, I, I can't give that up. I, so there is some bias there that I think of promotion as a positive thing. I think of it as an opportunity for advancement and growth and skill development and competency development and opportunities for citizenship. And that's the direction and the perspective that I'm going to take when we talk about promotion. So in terms of putting some context on what I mean when I'm talking about accommodation, it's quite a, a broad definition, and it's really looking at an adjustment or a modification of actions in response to obesity. So actions regarding objects, so the built environment, items, chairs, um, other products that we may use. And it's also um, accommodating the ways in which we perform a task. So again, I can't give up my occupational therapy roots and uh, always looking at ways of doing something that might not necessarily be the conventional way of performing a task, such as putting on socks or pants or drying oneself after a shower. So when I think of accommodation, I'm also thinking about ways in which we do everyday kinds of things may be modified and may not look, for lack of a better word, normal or typical. I also think of accommodation as an agreement that's acceptable to all parties in a dispute about the rights and responsibilities of a person with obesity. And so that requires a little bit of a, a, a shift uh, in, in the way that we think. So in order to achieve accommodations, we have to reconcile different perspectives or different points of view. And so the, the actual animals mean nothing. It's just the different eye level. So the giraffe has full access to above the clouds, and things are looking pretty good. Uh, the zebra's shorter, and it's a little cloudy and rainy. It might be something like in Vancouver, if you're in the mountains versus the mainland, I don't know. But what we need to do in order to have accommodation is we have to level the playing field. And we need to be able to see 
at the same level. That doesn't necessarily mean that we agree or we concede our values and beliefs, but there's a level of respect, respect and mutual understanding that has to happen. So there are opposing perspectives of obesity. And, you know, I think generally we're a very civilized group. We look at each other's posters and we hear each other's research and we, we nod. And I think there's a general agreement that obesity is a complex health condition that is caused by a number of factors beyond the individual. But outside of this room or outside of this conference, and maybe even within this conference, I don't know, there's a lot of pressure and blame put on individuals living with obesity that they are solely responsible for their state of obesity and that they therefore are solely responsible for changing that no matter what. And so that's the extreme view that I'm, I'm, I'm posing here. And then the other one is the social responsibility where the individual actually has no responsibility. That um, it's not, you know, for lack of a better word, their fault that we can give over to, uh, for whatever reason, this person is, is living with obesity and it can't be changed. So it's really a contrast between an extreme of completely modifiable risk or factors and completely unmodifiable factors. But the middle ground here in this common point of view or reconciliation of opposing views is that obesity is a result of a complex interaction of factors in the social, the built environment, physiological, and genetics, and anything else that, that, you know, if we think about those foresight maps, there's so many different factors that go in. So that's what's required in order to even talk about accommodation, is to have some um, universal agreement about the causes and consequences of obesity. So, field of dreams. There's probably a copyright infringement here, so my apologies up front. I did get this off Google Images about 1 o'clock this morning. Um, and, you know, it, it, there's this fear that if we build it, they will come. If we make our world a better place for individuals living with obesity, we won't be able to handle the demand. And what I'm saying is that we need to build a level playing field. We need to create environments where people can play together, can socialize together, can work together, can educate together. And we need to create, if for lack of a better expression, a field of dreams where it's universally accessible, including individuals living with obesity. So there are some premises or, or preconceived notions that support arguments against accommodation. And that's persons with obesity should not be conserving energy. They should be expending it. I have written more prescriptions for scooters and wheelchairs and walkers than I care to think about. And when I write them for individuals who do not have obesity, I rarely get any feedback except thank you for doing this for my patient. Or this is wonderful the provincial government will be more than happy to pay 80% of the cost for that mobility device. When I write a prescription for someone with obesity, I have gotten responses back saying from perhaps a referring physician, I want my patient to move more, they need to burn more calories, and I refuse to allow them to use this mobility device, and I've told them not to fill the prescription. So we see this paradoxical thinking. I think we really need to start to have a shift in what we perceive as energy conservation and energy expenditure. Energy conservation from a rehab point of view, or from the perspective of at least occupational therapy, and probably my physiotherapy colleagues as well, is that it's intended to conserve energy to reduce pain, to reduce fatigue, to prevent joint damage. It's not to create obesity. That's not why we teach energy conservation. So I want my patients to conserve energy so that they have the energy to do the things that are important and meaningful to them, which is going to work, which is playing with their children, which is going dancing or enjoying themselves socially out in the community. If I deny 
somebody access to energy con conserving modalities such as powered mobility through a walker or a wheelchair or a different way of doing something, I'm denying them the energy to expend in meaningful everyday occupations. And that just doesn't sit well with me. Another argument against accommodation is that persons with obesity are not entitled to resources designed for people with legitimate disabilities. And I hear this from healthcare practitioners, from the general population. I also hear it from patients living with obesity. I did this to myself. I don't deserve access to this equipment or this resource. That's for people with a disability, and I don't have one. And in fact, when we talk about accommodations, it's not necessarily just for people with disabilities. It's to make life easier and more accessible for everybody. So it's overcoming that stigma attached to accommodations that they're just for the disability world. They're not. They're really for everybody. And to label something as a disability or not really isn't the argument here. It's really about having access to being able to perform the things that you want and need to do on a daily basis. The other argument against accommodations is that making life easier for persons with obesity will serve as a disincentive to changing their obesity status. So if we provide accommodations in our built environment or our social attitudes, there won't be any pressure for individuals with obesity to change their ways. And that just doesn't make sense. But we hear that all the time. We will show as a society that we condone obesity and that, we don't, that we're not concerned of it as a chronic health condition if we make life easier for individuals with obesity. And that's not the case at all. In fact, it's quite the opposite. By providing accommodations, we're providing opportunities for individuals to be more active, to be more engaged, which promotes health and well-being overall. And then a, third, a fourth point is that providing for accommodations implies acceptance of reckless behavior. Now, I had a quote, but I didn't want to put it here because I didn't want to be over the verge of controversial because I didn't know if that person would be here or not, <laughs> so I wasn't that brave. But this was a very well-known academic in North America that said making life easier for individuals with obesity might be okay, but I think it's the wrong thing to do because it shows that we think it's okay to be obese. And this is a well-informed individual. And that's not the case at all. So we're not condoning reckless abandon for not taking care of oneself at all when we're promoting uh, accommodations. So examples of some accommodations, and I actually borrowed something from uh, Dr. Taylor there. From uh, I, She had a slide. I didn't go quite as far as lifting the slide from one of her presentations, but um, <laughs> she probably wouldn't have minded, but I didn't want to push that. So one of the things, things that happened at Disneyland is, uh, or Disney World, they have the small world boat ride at Disneyland. Um, I personally couldn't stand the music, so I didn't go on the ride, but um, for those of you who have been on it, um, apparently it's boats that float through sort of a, a miniature world or something, but they had to re-engineer re the uh, ride in 2007 to accommodate larger passengers. So the original ride was built in 1963, and as the average size of the population increased, the boats were becoming stuck in the flume, and people needed to be rescued um, from the ride, and they had to keep shutting the ride down. So rather than tell society, hey, you're getting too big for Disney World, they made an accommodation to make their customers more comfortable and to keep the ride going. Now, we know what their motivation was, but again, that was the right thing to do. Can you imagine the outcry if they said, well, you have to be a certain size and shape to be allowed to ride this ride? They would never have gotten away with it. In the mid-2000, hospitals began to update and redesign waiting rooms and patient care areas to accommodate patients with obesity, and they developed training programs for staff to safely care for patients with obesity. That wasn't that long ago, so I've been practicing as an OT since 1990 or so, and that never came up when I first started working in the hospital environment. 
And it just, it, it just, I don't remember it ever being an issue, which to me is very concerning because we were probably neglecting a, a group of patients that were, that were suffering quite badly. But now you will notice that there is more awareness happening, and I'm really happy to see that more hospitals are um, anticipating patients with obesity rather than reacting when they show up in emergency and it's a scramble to find the right equipment. It's humiliating for the patient. It's unacceptable care. It puts the patient at risk and it puts the care providers at risk. And so there is a spirit of, of anticipating and providing uh, the appropriate equipment and care for patients in the hospital environment. Manufacturing of wheelchairs and walkers that support patients with obesity is becoming a standard practice beyond custom orders. So when I first started working on um, working with people to prescribe wheelchairs, it was very, very, very expensive, and you really had to find a good engineer to work with to, in order to be able to construct uh, individual wheelchairs. You couldn't just open a catalog and pick and choose things that you can do more so now. And it's also really exciting for me to see vendors at uh, conferences such as uh, the Canadian Obesity Network here displaying really great stuff. I'm not endorsing any one product here, but just to see that there's some thought now being put in behind the needs. And uh, also retrofitting ambulances with lifts and stretchers to support up to 850 pounds. And I pulled this from a newspaper in Boston that reported that. So what are some outcomes associated with accommodation? So when I first agreed to do this talk, I'm like, oh, this will be great. I'm going to show you guys all these studies and evidence that support everything I'm advocating for. <laughs> um, I couldn't find any. <laughs> There's no evidence because we haven't studied it. We know it's the right thing to do. We know from looking at accommodations with other marginalized populations that they are effective but we haven't studied it in obesity yet, and we need to do that. I'm promoting energy conservation because it's the right thing to do and because it enables participation in other activities. Is that associated with weight gain or weight loss? I don't know. We need to look at that. So some of the outcomes associated with accommodations is access to places of employment, education, recreation, and self-care. It increases opportunities for skill development, competency development, and the development of networks of support. It enables diversity and respect. Remember I talked about promotion being publicity and increased visibility? You'll never learn to respect and understand the skills and abilities of individuals, particularly with severe obesity, if we don't have the opportunity to meet them. I'm so privileged in the work that I do to meet the most incredible people and to hear their stories. Um, it's increased um, visibility of persons living with various chronic conditions, that we can rejoice in the skills and the resilience and the abilities, and what a shame to miss out on some of that if people are not able to get out of their homes. And it really does have the potential to save some money. So I'm going to give you a few examples. I am by no means saying that having obesity is the equivalent to any of these chronic health conditions that I'm going to talk about, but these are areas in which accommodations have been studied, and so we know there is some evidence around the outcomes associated with them. So in terms of accommodations and mental illness, when an employer offers flexible hours, when there is training for managers to be more aware of the causes and consequences and ways of working with employees with mental illness. There's an earlier return to work from sick leave. There's increased job satisfaction, not just with the individual living with mental illness, but with their coworkers and management. And there's also reduced employee turnover, which benefits everybody. It benefits the company, it benefits the colleagues, and it saves money from not having to retrain constantly. <coughs> supported employment for adults with intellectual disabilities. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with what supported employment is, this is not sheltered employment. Sheltered employment is where everybody with an intellectual disability is in one building doing a very similar job with very little interaction with anybody outside. Supported employment is a movement where adults with intellectual 
uh, disabilities are actually mentored and supported to be integrated into the uh, competitive employment field um, through mentorship and support and training. And through supported employment, the individual benefits from increased social status, skill development, community involvement, and engagement in leisure and recreation. So it's beyond, it's, it, it's beyond going and having a job. There's so much payoff. And this is just about having that ability and opportunity to participate. Accommodations for persons with spinal cord injury. Um, we use mobility devices, uh, ramps, curb cuts, and so on, which leads to increased employment, increased social interaction, decreased poverty, improved mental health, and improved physical health. So I'm getting the sign to wrap up, so I'm going to move a little quick. Oh, perfect, in summary. So <laughs> that was pretty good, eh? So uh, in terms of association of accommodation for obesity with prevalence rates is not known, nor is it known for any other health condition, really. So we don't know that by increasing the number of curb cuts, did the number of spinal cord injuries increase? Hmm with more employment opportunities for individuals with mental health problems, did the rates of mental illness suddenly increase? I don't think so, but we need to, we need to explore this. Accommodations for persons with, uh, with obesity could promote the health and well-being of persons living with obesity, but not just the individual, their friends, their family, and the colleagues that get the privilege and benefit of their, their, their uh, skills and talents. And evidence is needed to explore the physical, psychosocial, and economic outcomes associated with accommodations. So this is part of, as I'm, I'm starting at the University of Alberta in July, uh, building a program of research in bariatric rehabilitation. This will certainly be a pillar that I, I hope to be able to continue. So in closing, the worst form of inequality is trying to make unequal things equal. And so expecting individuals living with obesity to be able to perform and contribute and engage and thrive in environments that don't support them is inequality. So I'm going to end with that. And I think we're OK for time. <laughs> Can we stay here? Thank you very much, Dr. Forehand. I'm just going to say that from this zebra's perspective, I see you as someone who is outstanding in the field of dreams. <laughs> but we're open to questions. Oh, I see one. Great. I'm going to be uh, the devil's advocate here because I grew up being the smallest in the class until I was in grade seven when I suddenly took a growth spurt and I was the fourth smallest in the school. So now um, I'm not really believing these things, okay? okay. So, but I'm just going to say the thought, opposite thoughts. So I'm not saying I believe these things, but I'm just going to tell you other thoughts, okay? okay. Um, there has been uh, a lot of uh, talk in the media about people going on planes and paying the same price for taking up two spaces on a plane. Yeah. Uh, and if you break a chair in an environment, or, or everybody else is supposed to pay for the chair that you break when they come to the restaurant because you happen to sit on a chair that was too small for you. Uh, if you're, um, uh, if we do, if we smoke, if we do not support smoking, uh, why would we support obesity? Because it's a health risk. Um, then, is it fair for the big person to sit in front of a small person? Our fares are all required to have a certain height and weight minimum to go on their rides. So why would we not then expect maximum heights and weights for certain rides? So that I don't think Walt Disney World really were caring about the weight. I think they just wanted to make more money. Okay, and cars have to be readjusted for the morbidly obese. Now, are they safe to drive? We don't know that. Mm -hmm. So those are just some yep. thoughts that occurred Absolutely. to me while you were talking. Yep. Not that I believe that we shouldn't be doing these things. It's yep. just that there is other sides to the argument. Absolutely. Um, I, I hear those arguments all the time. And I didn't bring it into my discussion because it, it's certainly not an area I'm an expert in. But um, in terms of um, disability laws 
and um, employment laws. Uh, we have a, a, a moral and, and legal obligation to accommodate um, within a reasonable amount uh, in the work environment, in a public environment. And I think, however, in terms of obesity, that definition of what is reasonable has become very, very narrow. And we're not flexible enough in looking at all of the possibilities. We're very quick to come up with the why nots. So I'm not going to address all of those points. I hear them. I, I think we probably all have heard them. Um, I think some of that is just social behavior and good social skills that if you're blocking someone's view, you don't sit in a venue where, when I had big hair in the 80s, I didn't sit in the front row, you know? So <laughs> I sat at the back. So, I mean, I know I'm, I'm being flippant, but I think in terms of it's an important conversation. I'm not saying that accommodation is something we can do easily or readily or should be done all the time. I think that it's that, that reasonable amount, but when um, and the World Health Organization really talks about disability and participation. And when we have modifiable factors, such as those in the built environment, that can enable participation in activities of daily living that promote health and well-being, we have an obligation as researchers and healthcare practitioners to do that. So, one more question. Mm -hmm. You gave some examples of areas where we've made tremendous progress in accommodation. Yeah. I want to get a sense of where we are in, in accommodating obesity. So maybe on a yeah. scale of one to ten, where one would represent zero would represent one would represent no mm -hmm. progress and ten would represent the progress we need to have yeah. to be optimal. Where are we on that scale? Um, you know, I, I that's a great question, Ian. Um, I, I I want to say three. I think we have a long way to go, um, and, and I'm saying that from the perspective of when I um, recommend a change in environment for somebody who has a musculoskeletal disorder that doesn't have obesity, it's a lot easier for me to do. So I'm going to say three. I'm going to stick with that. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Kim. Okay.